Thank you for uh, having the opportunity to, to speak uh, about the work that is happening in, in Brampton, also with regard to, uh, to mission. Um, you may notice that on the screen here, it says mission in Brampton, developing churches in multi-ethnic communities. And when I put the PowerPoint together, this was the suggested slide that would come with it. I thought, how appropriate, because it's the world has indeed come uh, to Brampton. Um, there are so many different nationalities uh, that are living in Brampton, and so many of them that we also uh, come across. When I When I first came to, to Brampton and accepted a call back in 2006, I really didn't know what I was getting into in, in the future. At the time, it was a congregation of about 185 members. Um, they needed a pastor. There was uh, certain needs. There was a desire for the congregation to be, uh, uh, to be more established, but also to perhaps grow. But not from the perspective of missions, but from the perspective of keeping people that are there. Also, there was a good core of young people at the time. But the reality is, is that over time, uh, members began to move away, young people began to move away, and we, and we became smaller. Now, one thing that I might say here is um, we often have this uh, idea that as came from churches, we can't change, change our mindset, we can't change our approach uh, towards missions and towards uh, other people. But if you want to see a, a church that has changed its mindset, it would be, I would say, the church in, in Brampton. I've seen a, a huge uh, change in mindset. And that doesn't mean that we have come to where we want to be or where we need to, to be in that change of mindset. But people have, have thought differently about our calling in, in the world where the Lord has, has placed us. And the Lord has his own way of uh, making those uh, changes, also in the mindset of God's very own people. Uh, one of that is simply a matter of necessity. As we began, as we became smaller, uh, what is going to, what is our future going to be? And so we could have taken the attitude of, well, there's no future, and the church is going to fold, and we're going to disappear, uh, and it would have been a defeatist uh, attitude. But instead, as a congregation, we began to look and say, so what is the Lord's calling for us? One of the things that was, had happened when I first came was there was a committee had been struck. What do we do with our uh, you know, church building. This is the church building where we were worshiping in. Um, we had the church building, plus there were some four acres that had been bought back in the 80s. And we know that the developers were interested in, in our land. And the question was, what do we do? Do we renovate the building do we, or do we build a, a new building? So that was a discussion that was going on when, when we came. But as, we, as time developed and as the church became smaller, we say, well, what's the sense of building a, a new building? And we came to the conclusion that if the Lord gives us this opportunity, then what is the purpose of having a, a, a new building? Is the Lord showing us something? Is the Lord directing us in a certain way? And the increasingly, the congregation began to, to think in terms of, if the Lord gives us a new building, then the Lord must also have a purpose for us as a congregation. And that purpose, we felt, was to reach out into the community. So here we have our new building, which we moved into in 2014. And it has indeed been a blessing to be uh, the base from which we're able to reach out into our community. In our old building, we never had anybody uh, attend the worship services. First of all, people wouldn't even know how to get into the building because there's different doors and, and most of the doors were, were locked shut and you wouldn't be able to get in that way anyway. But this particular building is, is one that is um, very much uh, accessible uh, to, to the people. This is from the, from the parking lot view where people come in through the front doors. It looks like the picture's a little bit distorted. And this is a view from the sidewalk on New Year's Eve. And when people walk by, they're able to look right into, uh, into, uh, into, the, into the building. They're able to see us actually worshiping there. So one of the things I've mentioned earlier in this week at another conference was architecture can make a, a huge difference. 
building that is accessible, that people can look into, can feel comfortable about, they are able to, uh, to come into such a, such a building. So it has been a, a real blessing. Every Sunday we have many people coming off the streets, many that come and worship together with us, some Sundays more than others. Once in a while we have a Sunday where we don't have any, besides our regular guests, we don't have anybody, and everybody comments on, oh, we didn't get anybody this morning. We're rather uh, surprised uh, by that. We live in a city that is ethnically diverse, people from all different nations. But that begins already in our own congregation. So as I was re reflecting on how I, will I talk about this, one of the things I thought, wait a minute, let's take a look at the congregation right now. First of all, this one here is, we're talking about our council makeup. What is the, the makeup of the council? Well, we have one Dutch elder, one Dutch deacon. We have one elder who has Dutch blood and blood and Guiana blood. His father was a Hindu. We have a man from Germany, from, I mean, he's a German uh, Swiss, so from Switzerland, Europe, Roman Catholic. We have a, a young man, a deacon from Guiana. We have a, a, a deacon from Brazil, Roman Catholic background, a charismatic background in, in Brazil. And then we have two, two ministers, and they are basically, uh, oh, they are the Dutch. This is a picture of our last council meeting last week. Um, these are the, the brothers that are around the table. Uh, we don't, I mean, I don't even think about them as, be, as well, we're ethnically diverse. They're just our brothers. Uh, and yet they all have different, different backgrounds. Um, the one brother in, in the top corner sitting beside Pastor Eric at the top, he's actually not a, a council member. He has been a council member in the past. He's our treasurer. And he is uh, a Portuguese. Uh, so even within the leadership of the church, uh, we have all kinds of different uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic um, the diversity. Well, as far as the congregation itself is concerned, if we look through the congregation, uh, we have a Dutch majority, of course, but we have people from Portugal, from Switzerland, uh, from Palestine, a woman who, is, uh, who has actually grew up and born in Bethlehem, a lady from Cameroon. Uh, we have Brazilians from Guyana, St. Vincent, uh, and the from the Caribbean. Uh, so those are, uh, are actually members of the church. Those are being categorized right now, so they're not actually members. Our, if it's a family from Eastern uh, Europe, who have just received uh, protective status in, uh, in Canada. Uh, we have a lady from a German background. Her grandparents were Christians, but her parents were not, so she knows nothing about the scriptures. We have an African-American girl who, uh, from Roman Catholic background who uh, is, is attending and wants to become a member. We have a, a man and his, and his wife. He's a Scottish Native American mix. Uh, last week I had a very interesting conversation with him about the reserves and about the, the natives here in, in, in Canada, the aboriginals, I guess we call them nowadays, um, and talking about also the resistance to the gospel when, when he meets and talks with his own family members. His wife is, an, is from Italian background. Um, we have somebody that's a Portuguese, we have somebody from Northern Ireland, and there's also another lady I haven't mentioned here, she's from uh, Guyana. We think of those who have been worshiping with us over the past four years when we got into our, our new building. There's a very diverse uh, group here. These are the ones I could remember. I'm sure there were many others that I either, either never asked or haven't uh, or don't remember. But we have people from Chile, uh, Jamaica, Nigeria, South Africa, Philippines, India. Uh, we actually quit quite a few from, from India. Um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Egypt, Trinidad, Hungary, Italian, uh, Indonesian, a uh, fellow... Uh, Christmas, Christmas Day from Iraq. Uh, he came, he came after the worship service and he said, yeah, I said, the worship service is over. He says, don't you have another worship service? He expected that we have many worship services. And I had to say to him, listen, in Canada, it's even, it's even unique to have one uh, Christmas service on Christmas uh, Day. When we deal with uh, where we are in the, in the neighborhood, first of all, the city of Brampton population right now is 655,000. Uh, there is projected to be strong growth, so we probably end up in, around, around a million in, in a number of 15, 20, 25 years. We, the church itself is in the northwest quadrant. About 100 to 120,000 people live in that area. It's the fastest growing part of the city in which we are. 
Uh, and uh, Pastor Eric uh, did some research, and he tells me that there's only three churches in this area uh, in the, of the city. There's a Roman Catholic church, there's a Pentecostal church, and then there's a Canadian Reformed church. So that's also probably why we get quite a bit of, of traffic. Medium age of the city is about 34 years of age, so it's uh, a, young, a lot of young families uh, there in Brampton. Now we can just get this thing going. Um, as far as immigrants, some 50% are, are, are immigrants, 60% speak English in their home. So when it comes to uh, mission work, we realize that the majority of people still live, uh, speak English, so we're able to do our, our mission work in, in English. Uh, many homes, uh, there's more than one language spoken. I often come in, into a home and it was, you know, the parents will speak one language and the children will speak uh, you know, the English language. The city of Brampton has services in all these different languages. So you go to, to the city hall, and you can actually uh, receive, receive um, help. I'm just going to go quickly through this because my time is quickly... Um, as far as visible uh, minorities, about three-quarters of Brampton is uh, what's called visible minorities. So they, they actually they are the, the majority. Um, we're the... the as far as visible majorities are concerned, we're ranked fourth in, Can in Canada. Toronto, Montreal, and Calgary are, are ranked from one to, 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 to three. And the top uh, vis visible minority groups are South Asian, Blacks, and then Filipino. Um, here's some excellent composition. I'm just going to go quickly through this. Um, languages, Punjabi is probably the, 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 the one that's spoken most frequently. They've got Hindi, Urdu. And then a number of others, you see at the bottom there, Portuguese, Italian, and, and Arabic. So there's a sizable Muslim community as well. Okay, I need to go back. So challenges with regard to mission in a multi-ethnic city. What should the church look like? And I would say that church should look like the community in which you find a church. If you have uh, a mono-ethnic community, the church will be mono-ethnic. It will reflect that. If you have a multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic community, the church should reflect uh, that just uh, as well. And I believe that that's something that we need to be striving for. We should not be thinking that we're going to keep our own Dutch heritage or we're going to keep our own nationality. We need to be understanding that we have a responsibility to the community in which we are, are living uh, if you think of the gospel, the gospel, Paul says, is a means by which God is breaking down the walls between, uh, Greeks and Jew uh, between the Jews and Greeks, and so also between nationalities. And so if there's any, any group that is able to live together, there should be Christians who, uh, who together serve Christ and worship Christ. Uh, we live in a world where there seems to be more, more division and as race and differences are being enhanced and, and being talked about also in the political world, it, also, it only drives people apart. But in the church, we're being driven together as we together we serve our Lord in Jesus Christ. So, uh, challenges for mission in a multi-ethnic uh, city. Some challenges. For the, first of all, with regard to the congregation. The congregation indeed wants to be uh, credible in reaching out to the community. A change of attitude needs to take place in the life of the congregation, also in the life of in God's uh, people. Um, change of attitude, first of all, is one of looking out and, and realizing that's our responsibility, and that's what we want to do for the sake of our Lord in Jesus Christ. That change of attitude needs to happen <clears throat> so that when guests do come into the church, uh, that, God, that the congregation is comfortable in speaking with guests so that we don't just leave a guest over there, standing over there and just go, well, I don't know, I'm a little bit scared. No, we actually go and, and speak to those guests. I can say here in Brampton, uh, it's, it's incredible to see how God's people or how the people there have embraced that need to speak to people. There's not a person who will get out of the entrance of, of the church building without having been spoken to at least two or three times. A lot of times people come to me as I stand at the door and they said, oh, your people are so friendly. And said, We've talked to three different people on the way, uh, on the, on the way out. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that is indeed incredibly important. Another one that... That I think is really important is the next one, dealing with one's own racist attitudes. And that's something, unfortunately, 
we find even among God's people. We find also in, in our churches. People will often speak about Brampton, and they'll talk about Brampton as Bramladesh. And when they do that, they don't mean that in a, in a kind way. They mean that in a, in a more of a, uh, of a negative kind, kind of way. And I think those are also the kinds of attitudes that it's, we need to repent of. Understanding that these are all God's, God's people created in the image of God, and we need to genuinely care for them. So we need to develop a genuine love for people of all races, uh, realizing that they too, they need the gospel. The other aspect that needs to happen, I think also within the church, is a new attitude of how can we serve the community? We often think, oh, the community needs the gospel, and we want to go out there, we want to preach the gospel, and we want to tell people about Christ, we want the people to, to know what we know. But that's not how the gospel goes out. That's not our task as, as, as churches to be thinking only in terms of how do I reach these people with the gospel? The first attitude we need to have is, how do I love the people in my community? How do I show that love? How do I serve those people with the gifts that Christ has given to me? And it's only when, when we begin to learn to serve the community and genuinely care about the community uh, that the opportunities are also there to speak to the community about the gospel. Listening to our guests is something that is incredibly important. Um, only when, when we listen do you get to understand what their needs are. Do you understand also some of the barriers that they might have in order to become part of, of, your, uh, of your community. Uh, listening also involves both min uh, the ministers of, of, of the congregation. As ministers, we need to be thinking, how do we make the gospel accessible to those who are coming through our doors? Uh, and often we don't realize how our, our preaching is inaccessible. Even in our teaching, if I'm teaching a class of, new, of those who are new to the faith, I need to constantly be thinking and even be, be just kind of reading the, the classroom. Do they understand that? Is there somebody who has a quizzical look on their face? And so often you'll find that, I may have mentioned David, and, and who's David? And so those are the things that we don't always, we need to be thinking about. So when there's also guests in the church, that I don't just talk about David and make a reference to him, but I have to talk about who David is. I need to explain a little bit about the story that I might be using to explain something. Uh, and when it comes to certain terms, certain words, that we can't just simply say righteousness. We need to explain what is righteousness about. It doesn't mean it has to be a, a long explanation, but just a, a quick word as to explaining uh, those basic uh, concepts. Um, with regard to members of the church, when you have guests and you invite them and you, and you speak to them, that also within groups that you include them in your conversations, that you be careful that you don't speak about all the things that you did all that week, but that you speak about things that they can be included in that conversation uh, uh, as well. I think I'm We need to take into account sensitivities from different groups. Um, language, of course, is an issue. Uh, we get people from different backgrounds. I know my ear is attuned maybe to Dutch accents, but uh, different accents can be very difficult. Last week, I had a couple of Nigerians, and it took me a while to try to figure out what they're trying to say to me. And you really need to work at trying to, trying to under, understand them. Um, there's, of course, other issues with regard to language. A lot of people don't know English that well, so how do you speak to them in a way that, uh, that they understand what you're saying? Um, I need to go on a little quickly here. Um, also, be sensitive to our approach to people of different, uh, different religions. Somebody may have come from a Muslim culture, um, and you need to understand also their worldview. For example, um, we have a lady that, that comes once in a while to church, and I'm actually being, have begun to, to teach her. Um, she grew up in a Christian family, but in a, Muslim, in a Muslim area, and she asks sometimes that I might pray for her. And she feels like, I'll have Jesus in my heart. And, and when I sat down to, for the first teaching session, I realized Jesus to her is different than the Jesus I'm thinking about. For her, Jesus uh, is just a good man. And so the Muslim idea of, of Jesus being a man, he's not God. And so that was the first thing we needed to start talking about. Um, 
So there's other kinds of sensitivities. We've talked about witchcraft this morning. Reminds me of, it reminded me of this, this woman who's now a member of the church, has three wonderful daughters, a wonderful family. But I remember in catechism instruction, there was a certain point we talk about superstition. And she says to me, you know, when I get home, I always walk backward through the door. And I say, why? And she said, well, because uh, the, that way the evil spirit won't come with me into the house. Uh, now, she, of course, had known enough of the Christian religion, realized that wasn't really proper. Uh, and she didn't really believe that the evil spirits were there, yet she had been conditioned that way from, gro- from, from youth growing up in the, in the Hindu uh, household. And so I talked about electric, um, electric uh, approach at that particular time. I said to her, I have two words for you, and that is, stop it. And it worked. Oh, get back there. Somehow I hit the wrong button here. Uh, secular persons. How do we deal with uh, those who come from a secular background? What we don't always realize is people from a secular background don't always have a very flattering view uh, of Christians. Um, and as Christians, we have to be careful that we don't um, reinforce the, the stereotypical idea of being unloving and intolerant. For example, we talk about ethical issues um, we can make very, we can just reinforce the fact, you know, okay, for example, homosexuality or those kind of issues. And if we talk about it in a very negative way, it simply reinforces for them, you see, these are intolerant people. They're, they're, not, um, they're not loving. So we need to be, be careful also that we don't reinforce those kind of uh, stereotypes that people have of us. Um, the lifestyle of people, we're going to deal with people all kinds of different lifestyle. Common law relationships. Uh, last was it back in in December? I started teaching a woman who said, "I want to become a member of the church." She's been worshiping with us for about about a year and a half. Came first of all with her mother, and then later on her husband came with her. And uh, the first session I had, I said, uh, "We want to give you a mailbox, um, but I, I've got two names for you. Which name is the right one?" And she gives me this is the name, uh, and she says, uh, "The name is is the name of my partner," referring to. We, whoever we thought was her husband. Um, so I'm teaching them to become members of the church, but they're living in a, homo, they're living in a common law relationship. What do we do in that situation? Well, I said, well, no, we're, gonna keep, we're gonna keep on, uh, on studying and we're learning God's word, and as you learn that, um, we'll have to talk about, the, about, your, 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 about your situation. We'll get there, and, and we just believe that the gospel will change attitudes and we'll change them in such a way that deal with it in a proper way. Uh, homosexuality, gender issues. How do we talk about those things in a, in a way without compromising our faith and yet not in a way that we push people away from us as well? I've got two minutes in which I cannot take care of all of this. Um, but uh, Dr. Levisha asked me, at least I would deal with mono-ethnic churches. There's a challenge with regard to mono-ethnic churches in our culture, um, where, there's, where people from, from the same culture will meet together and they will worship uh, uh, together. And usually the reason, at least that I have found that that's happening in the GTA, is that because uh, the older members who have immigrated, they don't understand English. They need the gospel in their own language. And so they, they form these churches. But the result is uh, that they have children and their children don't understand those languages. They speak English. I was talking about this, uh, this Muslim woman. I was teaching in her house, and her son walks in. And uh, when her son walks in, she had to say something to him. How does she speak to him? She speaks to him in Arabic. I don't understand a word she says. But her son replies back, and he re- replies back in English. Um, and that's the reality. The younger generation knows English, the old, uh, whereas the older ones do not. So what happens is, is that the younger members want to worship in, in the English language. And the result is that you get this tension. Um, I remember meeting a girl from the Hungarian uh, Reformed Church in Toronto. And she worshipped with us. And she talked about the fact that the young people are leaving the Hungarian Reformed Church because uh, they don't understand. They want the, the gospel in, in the English language. Um, there's the Indonesian Reformed Church. Reverend Sadiwa, he was here last night. He's not here to, 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 today. But they have a situation where they have two services. 
They have one for the older members in Indonesian and one for the younger members uh, in the English. I have the privilege to be able to, to preach in the English one. Um, but the services are quite different. The music is totally different as well. So there is that disconnect between the generations and that's going to be a, a real issue uh, for that particular uh, congregation. So on the one hand, we understand that there may be need for people of the same language group to be able to, to worship together because that's the only way they can understand. But there's also a need um, to, to understand how do we deal with, how do they deal with their youth? Um, even in the Indonesian Reformed Church, they are also tr trying to become more diverse, also inviting others. In fact, uh, there was a t I met a, a member or a person who's now worshiping the church, and he's Filipino, going to the Indonesian, uh, into the Indonesian church. Um, the other thing that we probably need to be thinking about as far as dealing with the language challenges um, is... We need solid reform material in different languages for that first generation. And so we need to develop that. With regard to that woman from the Muslim um, background in Arabic speaking, I give to her a, a catechism in Arabic language. Give that to her. Um, and then I teach her in English. But there's always that challenge because she, uh, she, well, she's, she can speak in English. It's, it's not an easy way to, to communicate. Um, but my point here is by having good, solid reform material in, that, in those languages is that they, in turn, can also send that material back home to whatever country they came to in order to uh, help them uh, to evangelize um, people back in their, in their own uh, country. 